She is the founder and CEO of Beyond Global. She is a world leading authority on finance and macroeconomics. She's an advisor to some of the greatest household name CEOs on the planet. She is a speaker, an author, and her most recent books, Super Hubs, is already an international bestseller, and it's already on the prestigious Bloomberg Book of the Year. It's on that list, and she is with us here today. Sandra, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here, Anthony. Thank you so much indeed for, for coming along. So as I said, it's an international bestseller, but it's also got some incredible endorsements. Just to name a few, we've got Stephen Schwartzman, CEO of Blackstone, Larry Summers, President of Harvard University, Nobel Laureate Ned Phelps, His Excellency, Mr. Aziz, former Prime Minister of Pakistan, and Professor Klaus Schwab, Chairman of the World Economic Forum. I could go on and on, but I know I'd bore you. But why has, I mean, obviously those endorsements are great for book sales, but why has this book hit such a nerve? Well, I think it's because today we're seeing a crisis of capitalism. Many people think that the system is rigged and the super hubs that I describe in my book, they do see the problem, they have identified it, but it's very hard to change the system even if you're a part of the system in such a privileged position. Yeah, sure. Okay, and, and talk about privileged position. As you say in the book, today eight people hold the same amount of wealth as the world's 3.6 billion poorest. So I mean, that's a huge, I mean, these people are extraordinarily powerful, aren't they? It's, is it the, um, the leverage that they get through the fact that they're in finance, which is different to any other sector, do you think? It's a result of power loss, and power loss is a dynamic of network science. I've explained the financial system through the people at the very top with the help of network science, and network science is a relatively new science and has gained popularity um, with the upcoming social media, essentially. Yeah. And it's um, a mathematical substantialization of how networks form, how they behave, and they always have the same structure, no matter if they're natural or man-made. Networks always consist of these little dots that you see in graphs, that are connected by whatever they're, you know, little lines, and um, no, they're called nodes, the, the dots that are connected, and the dots at the outset, at the fringes, uh, have a few connections, and the more you get to the, the closer you get to the center, um, the more connected nodes are, and the right. nodes at the very center are called the super hubs, and they are connected to virtually everything else. And in my book, I call these people at the top of the financial system, whether it be CEOs of banks or of big you know, billion dollar funds or central bank governors, I call them the super hubs because they're connected with everything and everyone and they have the most power over the system. Okay, so give me an example of a few names. Well, that would be Mario Draghi or Janet Yellen, central bank governors who, uh, you know, the, the head of the, of the Fed of the United States is probably the most powerful person next to the president. And you have to see those people are not democratically elected. Um, mm -hmm. And so also it could be a Jamie Dimon, it could be a Mervyn King, uh, the former head of the central of the Bank mm -hmm. of England, um, a Christine yeah. Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund, these types of people. And the reason why I came to mm -hmm. write about it is because I've, I see them I've seen them over the years, and you see, I, I call this their, their yearly migration pattern. Yeah. It starts in Davos at the World Economic Forum, and then they move to conferences and meetings um, where they meet their peers, and I saw that it's always the same people coming together yeah. and essentially making up the rules and influencing the system. Yeah. So um, in this populist world, I think people can be skeptical. Is it, is it you know, uh, is there a, um, some people think they're manipulating the masses, not just influencing the masses. Well, th one of the reasons why I wrote this book is, is I think it's important for everybody to understand how our democracy works, how our institution works, and how power works. And I think there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there and misrepresentation of the facts, and that results from the fact that this whole system is extremely complex and complicated, and people, you know, actually one way to reduce complexity and find solutions would be to simplify the system, but we can't just do it overnight. Actually, that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump came into power, because he offered simple answers. But I wanted to write this book to explain to people how it works. Of course, I'm biased, but it's not a bank bashing book. Mm -hmm. And the criticism that I do get, say, online is be, uh, that it's not critical enough. But today, if you write a book about the elites and you're, you don't bash them, it's not good enough because there's such a skepticism towards the elites. But I wanted yeah. to give you know, m my experience and rather matter-of-factly present how the system works. And I wanted to make it interesting uh, because it's very dry. And I wanted 
for my parents and my doctor and people who are not yeah. financial people to get a better impression how it works because I feel that yeah. most of the times these super hubs don't necessarily intentionally manipulate the system, but of course they act in their own interest, they act in, in their interest of their institutions, their shareholders, but many actions are agnos morally agnostic. Yeah. They're amoral, they're not necessarily immoral, but if all of these super hubs act in the same way and interact with each other in this echo chamber um, and are essentially removed from the ordinary population, in the aggregate their actions become negative for the system. Right. Okay. Because you yourself are a super hub, so you're a super hub talking about other super hubs, correct? Well, I wouldn't say I'm a super hub. I'm writing about super hub hubs and I write about my own experiences Mm. at the express request of the publisher, because I was a little hesitant. I didn't want to make this necessarily my story, but I certainly have interactions with yeah. super hubs. I'm not myself a super okay. hub. Yeah. But super well connected, because I see on, you know, if you just Google you for a minute, you'll see you with, you know, with uh, George Soros and Jamie Dimon and, you know, all these, all these people. So w w from your interactions with them, what would you say are some of the common characteristics and we're going to go into some other characteristics and attributes, but is there anything that they all share? Well, I would say at the top of their fields, and you see that at the top of every field, people are extremely intelligent, they're very well educated, and they're extremely industrious. But what gives them this quantum leap that puts them at the very, very top? And I have ident identified that part of the reason is that they're masters in building deep and resilient relationships and networks. And it's not just their, the individual power that they have, but the power in the aggregate that they have through their networks. Okay, so you mentioned interpersonal skills. So I mean, you quote it in the book, so these leaders can outsource all kinds of professional skills. They can outsource the, inter but they cannot outsource the interpersonal skills needed to build and develop resilient relationships. So is that really the X factor? Some of the very basic things of human nature, we know so well that we forget we know them. Yeah. We've kind of absorbed them with our so socialization mm -hmm. and we just need to realize them. And these, the super hubs that I've observed, it may not be obvious, but they're very, very good at maintaining, nurturing relationships and building new relationships. Okay, yeah. And do you think that this is a lost skill with the millennials coming through, very used to digital networking and LinkedIn? And, uh, so I go on LinkedIn and building social networks, but not real personal face-to-face uh, -face networking? Yes, uh, digital bytes can never replace personal relationships, and I explain it in more detail in the book why that is, why people can really only connect and build rapport in person and deep trust, and that's why these people who are always pressed for time invest such an inordinate amount of time and effort into building relationships, and they go, you know, okay, granted they have private jets mostly, uh -huh. but they go on the plane and they, you know, travel across time zones to connect with people and to make it a point to meet people at their home turf to actually also show the effort to see people in their cultural habitat yeah. and not just, you know, hold court in wherever they are based. Yeah, it's interesting because you also, which is good news for us because I'm former and leaders in a, a global events organizer, but uh, you say uh, Klaus Schwab um, wrote an article that in 20, 30 years time people will not go to conferences anymore because the digital dimension will change how people interact and how conferences are done. So, but you don't agree that digital webinars and that, you know, new platforms, digital platforms for, you know, connecting online are coming up all the time, but that's not the future. Well, I find it very hard to make any predictions uh, in view of Moore's law. Who knows where we're going to be in 30 years' time? I think that's sure. difficult to say, but for the foreseeable future, yeah. um, I think, you know, also now with the Trump phenomenon, he has called people into or suggested people for his cabinet that he has known for a long time. People like to work with people who they know and trust. Yeah. It's the oldest wisdom in the world. We all know this, but you see this. People tend to forget about it, and also this becomes the central point in conspiracy theories. Why do all these people huddle together who know each other as central bankers and heads of banks and so forth? Because they know each other. They have yeah. expertise that one seeks out in the other, and they complement each other well. Yeah. E all of us would do that. If there were, especially in times of crises, people tend to sidestep hierarchies and you know established rules to work together directly. And if you have an established network like this old boy network where people know each other, it's extremely helpful and very efficient. Picking up that uh, point you just made there, and I can see how they would all want to be with 
people that they are similar to them. In fact, you talk about it in the book with homophily, um, which is a term that you use a lot. And obviously, um, that term, you define it as similarity breeds connection. But I suppose, isn't that also the limiting term because it also would kill diversity? Exactly. The state of the world that we're seeing today that is very fragile, um, geopolitically, economically, financially, uh, you know, many people are expecting the next financial crisis to be just around the corner, many institutions, and that is a direct result of homophily. It, mm -hmm. People in the you know top echelon of institutions is a very homogeneous. I totally get that point, but do you think that the average Joe Schmo or Jane Schmo that wants to break into that group can, if they don't look like them, for example? I mean, you know, you're you're you're. It's, it's known as an old boys network, but yet you're female, and there have been, as you said, Christine Lagarde, for example, who's broken in. So, is it penetrable? Can you get into that? It's elite group? Yeah, it's very hard to penetrate. Um, I think you know, 40, 50 years ago it was hard, and then it got a little better, and now it's very hard again. And then. One reason is we have to distinguish a little bit between minorities. A woman is one subcategory, but just generally speaking, there is a, a famous test called the airport test. So let's say a big consulting company or whatever, big corporation, mm -hmm. but it's at, across all levels. They want to hire new people and they interview. And the people who interview with them, you know, just subconsciously, it's it's a subconscious bias. I don't think it's necessarily at all intentional, but you know, they kind of, sense does the person have the same reference point, the same accent, the same background, same, you know, golf club, vacation, right. schooling, and all of these things. And if you have a lot in common, you connect across more points, and that person usually will become more likable to you. And so you see the problem, people in power hire people who are like them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and has it come back to that? You said it was really bad and it got a bit better and it's got bad again. Is that because of the 2007-8 economic downturn that means trust? I suppose intuitively you can you feel like you can trust people that look like you and sound like you? Yes, I think I think at the entrance level, specifically yeah. in finance, diversity has become greater. There are more women, there are yeah. more minorities, but the higher you get yeah. in the hierarchy, um, the more homogeneous it becomes. And again, let's circle back to Donald Trump, the old white men cabinet. Yeah. There isn't much diversity, and probably the only reason why he um, asked a couple more women is because he wanted to incorporate his daughter into his team of advisors. And right. It couldn't be the only female was his daughter, so no. he hired a couple more. But other than that, it's a very homogeneous uh, cabinet. Yeah. Somebody told me recently that Sheryl Sandberg might be the uh, uh, CEO, sorry, the President of the United States one day. That'd be quite cool. Yeah, people have been talking about this for a long time, but again, I mean, she's in a very privileged position, and she wrote this book, Lean In, yep. and people, you know, have been critical, and I think to some extent, justifiably so, because stars were kind, it's a, it's a little bit similar to yeah. what I say about Christine Lagarde. These are great exceptions. All stars were aligned that supported families. Yeah. And, you know, it's not, there's very little, I think, that can be derived from these examples that normal people can actually apply in their everyday work. Okay. So what advice, which is a shame then, because yes. so we can't just model Christine Lagarde and yourself, who's done very, very well in, in the global world of finance. Um, so what advice would you give to a young female executive getting into the banking system or any, or any industry sector that wants to rule the world in 20, 30 years time. What, what advice would you give them? Well, I think to rise, you have to be a little better than men. So first and foremost, you have to invest in your education. And now that we live in a knowledge economy, you have to keep on educating yourself to the rest of your life. It's a dynamic process every day, you know, you have mm. to try and accumulate new skills. And then that also insulates you a little bit against uh, gossip and criticism. Right. And then networks, you have to network Network, because yeah. I think that's one of the distinct okay. advantages that women have. They're yeah. not plugged into the male networks and power channel and information channels. Women are not plugged into the same power network and information channels to the extent that men are. And so they have to work a little harder at networking. And I think first and foremost, they have to be super resilient because yeah. there will most certainly be setbacks and you know, insults and slights and women cannot afford to be 
offended. You just have to sort of swallow it and keep a stiff upper lip and keep on going. Okay. So you must have had a lot of, um, uh, you know, you must have uh, yourself gone against a lot of stereotypes and advances and rude comments and things along the way. So how, is that how you dealt with it? You just stiff upper lip, the British way of letting it go over the head? Yes. Okay. That must have been tough sometimes, though. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, if we can just go back to, uh, we've got you as a world uh, expert in networking. You've obviously been to Davos, and you go to Davos frequently. I think you're going there very soon as well. Um, and uh, I was asked when people found out in our community that we were interviewing you, if we could just do a, a sort of a network quick fire round, just to make sure that we've got some of the basics on the how to do good networking, sort of quick fire questions and quick fire answers. Um, you mentioned the book, uh, Dun The Dunbar Number, which means you can only maintain about 150 connections at any one time. So is it quality over quantity, do you think? Most definitely. What I see with the super hubs is they have um, a positive um, view of humanity. They're naturally interested in other people. They try to see the good in other people. They work on the premise that you can learn something from everyone. And I mean, we're all sort of trained or conditioned to work with biases and put people in boxes that we yeah. don't know. And it's part of our survival mechanism and to some extent it makes sense. But especially in today's world, you never know where you meet whom and you should be open to people and you should not yeah. prejudge people as a matter of common decency anyway without yeah. having any ulterior motives right. but if you have this natural disposition and train yourself to think like that and feel like that then it is helpful with regard to networks and of course they build social capital in advance they you know think like what how can I help other people yeah. um, what can I do for them without expecting something back here and now okay. but you I mean we're all Condition to think this way very on a very subconscious level. We build capital with other people It's not called social capital for nothing yeah. And when these pe people get into trouble or they need help or they need support they can call on other people They can draw on this social capital brilliant uh, next quick friend. What would you do? What would you say to somebody who thinks that um, networking is just for the schmoozers and it's almost dirty salesy word That's what the sales guys do yeah, I see where people are coming from and I understand that concern, but I don't think it's necessarily justified. Beca and I think the Americans have a very healthy attitude towards networking and it's probably yeah. because it's a melting pot. There people came, have come together from all different cultures and languages and sensitivities and they have found a common denominator. And the common denominator is we all need to make a living. We're upfront about it. We come together at events mm -hmm. and we all know that we need to network. We're not making false pretenses. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we have to be two-faced or you know that doesn't mean we have to be inauthentic or two-faced but um, I think it's just a very honest way we can connect and mm -hmm. nobody's forced to do business with other people and my own view is it's easy to get along with people who you like yeah. that's not you know that's a no-brainer yeah. what is really hard and what makes a good networker is to get along with people who may not like you so much or make it make it difficult and I think very few people, and that is justified, sometimes you just don't gel with somebody, yeah. and there may be good reasons, just very instinctual. Sure. But oftentimes, people may have reservations towards you because of a perceived slight. You may have not, gre you may have not greeted them when you came into a room like three years ago. Right. You didn't even notice, but something to offend that person, or some, for some reason they have a preconceived notion of, about you and I think it takes a great person to make the first step and you know towards the other person yeah. and just see if you can make it work. Yeah so the two things that you just mentioned there is about generosity going in with the, with the mindset of giving mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a key one and then going in and sort of you know rising above anything that might have been historical. Um, okay really practical one was emailed me this morning um, do you put all your contacts into a contact management system like ACT? This is really a very practical question, like Salesforce, Excel, how do you manage? I mean, you must have got lots and lots of contacts. How do you, do you maintain all of those contacts practically? I don't, but I don't deal with widgets. I don't have anything to sell. I mean, ACT and yeah. these databases, they make sense for people who need to, you know, call on lots of sure. people. But um, my 
work is slightly different. I work with you know just a handful of advisory clients, so it's very high level relationships. Nevertheless, I do have I feel I do have many more contacts that I can handle. It's a constant challenge. Yeah. I just work with Outlook and lists and um, yeah. and yeah, try to keep at it. <laughs> and then final quick fire round one came in this morning. How do you politely get away from somebody that's boring you senseless, trying to sell you pens or just blatantly a bit weird? Um, you just try to say, so you mean like at a party? Yeah. Yeah, just try and say something gracious. I don't want to monopolize your time or <laughs> try to pass this person on to someone else. You know, have to introduce you to so-and-so uh, or just, you know, see you next round or just I have to say hello to someone. I mean, there are tons of excuses, for lack of a better term. <laughs> I'll, I'll, if you ever say those to me, I'll know <laughs> that uh, I'll know what you're actually saying. Um, extroversion is uh, one of the personality dispositions that people think go naturally with networking. But as you said, the super hubs or you know, CEOs of any bank are running organizations with 300,000 people in them. So is extroversion an important part to be a great networker or are there introverted super hubs? They're more introverted super hubs than you might think. Right. Uh, Klaus Schwab, the head of the, the chairman of the World Economic Forum is one of them. The advantage is that when you're an introvert, uh, people sense it and when you are open and you make an effort in dealing with other people, people usually appreciate it because it is and comes across as very authentic and mm. sincere because when you do reach out, when you do give your attention, it usually you have to put in more effort and the other person notices it. I, I would say okay. I'm an introvert and um, I can only do a limited amount of networking at a time because it takes a lot out of me. Yeah, right, really. I would never have said that about you. Um, Ben Bernanke, obviously, you say in your book as well, who is uh, one of the most powerful people in the United States, was also introverted. But mm -hmm. uh, so, if you're not, if you're, what advice would you give to an introvert that goes into a room, hundreds of people all getting on, and you don't see any of the lone wolves on the side that you can go and save? What advice would you give to them that if they don't feel like networking, but they've got to go and do it anyway? Well, I would say, and I have these days when you're absolutely not in the mood and you can't get yourself to do it, don't do it because it probably will come across. Right. Um, if you have to do it, and still with all my experience, sometimes I feel uncomfortable when I get into a room and let's say it's full of testosterone, there are no right. women, and it's very homogeneous, and you know I don't know anybody and I have to make an effort to, you know, break into a group. I don't always necessarily feel like it, but you just have to get over yourself. And once the ice is broken, usually, you know, it becomes easier. But it's just, um, that's part of the hard part of networking. Sometimes it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. But um, was we interviewed uh, Sir Terry Leahy, and sometimes he said, even if you don't feel like doing it, sometimes you just have to do it. If you've, you know, um, it's about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable sometimes, mm -hmm. isn't it? Very true. Because as, as you say in your book, if you're at Davos, you don't want to be not in. I mean, that's such a huge opportunity that even if you don't feel like doing it, you should still do it, right? You should do it and you should try to pay it forward. And again, I think yeah. Americans are very good at it. And uh, Germans yeah. are usually not so good at it. And, right. you know, I come from Germany. People usually, you know, are a little uptight and they, when they find someone they know, they stick mm. with that person the entire night because that's where, who they're that's comfortable it. with. And, but in America, I think it's a little better in that when a person comes into a room and people sense that person doesn't know anyone, people usually make an extra effort to integrate okay. that person. And I've tried to adopt that. Um, and I feel bad if I see a, a, a lonely person, a lonely yeah. node at the fringe of the network who yeah. you can see doesn't really know how to get into things, then it's easy to embrace somebody who just Good. comes in, introduce okay. yourself and integrate them in a group of three people or so. And once that Great. person is integrated, it's easier for that person to circulate. Great. Well, I'm, I hope you're in the room next time <laughs> I'm lost somewhere in the room. Thank you. You go to Davos uh, a lot. So, and you mentioned serendipity, the importance of serendipity in this interview already. So if you go to Davos and do you literally just walk down the corridor and you bump into Bill Gates? I mean, does it happen like people think it does? Yes, it actually does, but that's a very extraordinary circumstance because one of the secrets of Davos' success is that it takes place in a very small village and they're, you know, I think all in all, 
at least 5,000 people are descending on this village. And basically, they are locked in this vacuum. So you bump into people, even if you don't want to network, you couldn't escape it because you bump into people at the bus stop, you know, the shuttle, the double shuttle stop, or the coat check, or, you know, wherever you are waiting in line, and there are lines everywhere. Mm. But it's extremely efficient because you just can't help meeting people that you already know who introduce you to other people or you could just introduce yourself because I mean I certainly people didn't know me necessarily but mm. I know everybody yeah. so you can just approach people because yeah. they feel they're in a safe space so they let their guard down yeah. and you know they're in like casual clothes and it's just very easy to interact in this social environment yeah that's right how by the way if you ever need anyone to carry your bags um just email <laughs> me at, um but how do you Let's just say the average Joe Schmo or Jane Schmo is watching this interview and they're very aspirational and they want to one day get to Davos or they want to be one of these super hubs or these high achieving people. What are some of the steps you think that y you need to take in order to have a shot of getting in to these circles? It depends on the network. There are all sorts of networks. Now, I'm writing about the very highest level and financial networks, but yeah. there are all different networks, cultural networks and you know, music or whatever it may be. Um, I think the secret, and that goes back to homophily, is to develop yeah. as many commonalities as you can. Sure. So you have a lot of things in common. People can relate to you. Yeah. Um, you know, Try to get achievements under your belts. Yeah. Have the same reference points. Speak the same language. Have um, currency, conversational currency, bring something interesting to the table. People may must yeah. want to associate with you. I mean, you don't want to spend your time with boring people, right? Sure. So you have to be interesting. You have to add to something. You have to. The lower you are in the food chain, the higher you have to. The more you have to try to build social capital. Right. Okay. Yeah. But as you say, you can't just be a schmoozy. You need to add some, you know, conversational currency and content to the. And I suppose that all comes back to the fact that, you know, you, you talk about the importance of obsession as, you know, looking at the some of the common characteristics that they're all quite obsessed. And if you are obsessed by your industry or what you're doing, then you'll have that social conversational capital to add. Um, you talk here about obsession. You're saying Elon Musk's, quote, Elon Musk's ex-wife Justine um, put it best when she said, extreme success results from an extreme personality. Um, so, w extreme personalities and, and being obsessed by things, what is it that they are obsessed by? Is it power? Is it wealth? Is it leadership? Is it influence? Doing better in the world? What do you think these super hubs are obsessed by, drives them? It depends. Um, there are different uh, silos, I would say. I would say many of the men are driven by the desire to acquire power. And I think f the fewest people are motivated purely by money on that level. Money for them is just a, a yardstick to distinguish themselves from other people as a measure of their success. Many of the people who I've seen and know um, live rather modestly. Uh, they don't live in gilded palaces. They, Because right. they can have everything, I think it means less to them. But then, you know, central bank governors or the Nouriel Roubini academics, an yeah. academic who I used to work with, they're more driven by content. They want to yeah. be at the top of their field and they really thrive on the intellectual, academic environment and, you know, the, at the very highest level. I personally am motivated by working with really interesting people and keeping on learning and having exposure to interesting things. Yeah. Um, that's what motivates me. So everybody, okay. but everybody is driven by something. If you have a nine to five job and, you know, prefer to have the weekend off, you're probably not going to get there. Most super hubs, mm. there is no delineation between private and professional lives. It completely yeah. overlaps. Their contacts are networks. They see the same people over the weekend that they've worked with. Right. They see the same people in Singapore at the country club or yeah. at a party than like they see in New York. So it's yeah. all one thing. They're, you know, you, they're never yeah. quite off. You always have to be, you're always on duty. Yeah, a lot of people we've interviewed talk about the sort of work-life integration as opposed to work-life balance. It's yeah, forget just, about it. it all, no you know, balance. Yeah. <laughs> but they enjoy it. They like yeah. it. If somebody calls me on you know, maybe from a different time zone on a Saturday night to get some th information or they need something done by Monday, chances are I'm not going to say no. Actually, I always say yes. <laughs> so um, still. But that's probably why you're successful because you always say yes. 
Probably, but I also enjoy it. Usually it's yeah. research or it's an interesting project and yeah. I'm often I'm you know, flattered that I'm asked yeah. or I'm thrilled that I can work with a certain yeah. company or party. So yes, I put my all into it. Um, yeah. It's not a nine to five job. I have mm. more freedom mm. on the one hand, but I can see how it is difficult with a family. And I think a lot of the super helps this family take a second role That's right. uh, to the profession. Yeah, because you do say in the book that a lot of them are absent uh, when it comes to partners or uh, family. But you do actually point a, a, a good side to that. You say that divorce rates are very, very low. Um, and uh, and you say this could be due to the uh, due to making the best out of the little time available, mm -hmm. having fewer opportunities to argue, which I think is a, a great a great point. But I suppose there's also going through a divorce saps these people of energy, time, focus as a distraction. Um, so let's look at some of the other the other um, attributes, if you can. I mean, you talk about alpha personalities, and sometimes they can be extreme. You say fueled by extreme confidence or extreme insecurities. How often do you think it's the latter? I think it's often insecurities. Yeah. Um, actually, I know, and I haven't really written about it in the book because sometimes it's things that I've become aware in personal interactions or things that family members have told me that I was uncomfortable putting into the public domain because it's not public knowledge. It may not be anything dramatic or super interesting, but for sure many people who have don't have the best self-confidence or have been slighted before um, have a chip on their th on their shoulders and that can yeah. be extremely motivating yeah absolutely i've got a friend of mine who went for um very very driven and they went for therapy and found out that she didn't her mother didn't love her very much so she's extremely insecure most driven person on the planet and then she went for therapy and realized it didn't matter if her mother didn't love her and then she's just can't get any energy and no motivation it's totally gone so you've got to love your insecurities as well they can be a okay i'm not going to see a shrink then no i won't either i'll stay away um let's talk about george soros i mean you obviously know him um you know and he like you when you first got to new york you had no money and no contacts nor did he so according to forbes today his real-time net worth is 24.9 billion is an ex is it extreme personality is it extreme risk what got him to go from there to there? Yeah, he's an extreme case, and I think his experiences as a survivor of the Holocaust gave him an intuition that has proven very helpful in sensing impending inflection points. Like when really big developments are around the corners, he has a sense, a second, seventh sense, but also he has the greatest networks. That was the whole point of the book. And yeah. for him to be one of my main characters is that he has consistently built networks, overlapping vast networks, all sorts of different types of networks, yeah. business and philanthropic and political and economic. All these networks together exponentially increase his power. And for an investor, information is the key to success. And if he, through his network, gets many pieces of the puzzle more than the average Joe, um, it may not be any, you know, state secret or anything that's, you know, he just he just has more pieces of the puzzle and the experience to put it together and to make a judgment. And of course, he's it's not as if he has never lost money. He's also mm. lost billions yeah. too. But um, on the whole, he's very successful. And I think it's because, and that's one of the points of my book is he's a super hub who understands how the world works, yeah. and that's what super hubs. That's why they're successful because they have this, you know, ten thousand foot perspective, yeah. and they see how the world works. Would and most other people don't. And I suppose, as you say, I mean, he was willing to put a lot of money on the pound, you know, and that is, I think, you know, the pound going down. I think that's what made him. So it's, it's taking extreme risk as well, but calculated risk, and having the leverage to be able to take opportunities when you see them. Yes, I think the uh, breaking the the pound was. Um, something that put him on the map publicly. Yeah. But I think he did a lot, many things that contributed to his success. And this, of course, created a lot of publicity. But he also, what is important is to, to generate content. Um, 
a, being rich can give you prestige, but never as much as content and intellectual content. And all the super have, have distinguished themselves in one way or another by putting out an ideology or a thought construct or a theory um, that distinguishes them from the rest of us. And they're they're yeah. taking an intellectual leadership. Right, absolutely. And this is the same with consequences. Why is the World Economic Forum so extraordinarily important as a networking platform? It's not just bringing together people. Why do these people come? Mm. Because the, the forum offers content. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And talking about the content, you know, you say uh, that one of the most enormous benefits of having this network is not a sort of a, a vanity fact that you know George Soros. It's the fact that you say in finance, the most valuable currency is actionable information that can be v converted into monetary gain. And so with the amount of misinformation, there's a lot of information out there, but the amount of misinformation, I mean, Facebook even calls it fake news. And so I suppose one of the benefits of this enormous network is that you can hear firsthand from the source information which is in finance in any industry enormously valuable. Yes, I started writing this book five years ago, which was way be before fake news, but misinformation has always been a powerful weapon in finance. And so not only do these people have direct access to yeah. information, but also these people make information, what right. a central bank governor is going to, the way he thinks, what he's going to decide. He's not going to tell anybody, but just knowing him and you know, getting sensing where things may be going is a piece of the puzzle that yeah. is valuable. Other people may, you know, if you talk, if, if investors talk to CEOs, you know, where it's legal, and I, I would say yeah. generally people are pretty careful, but you get a better sense of where things are heading, and that's a, an invaluable advantage. And of course, for people to tell mm. you something, they have to have trust. That's right. Right? They're not going to just tell this to anybody. No, absolutely right. Yeah. Some of the conspiracy theories out there is that the whole, you know, everyone owns their Ferraris and their super yachts because of insider trading. I mean, does that, how prolific is that? As you said, you said legal information, but how prolific is illegal, do you think, within the business world and the finance world? Well, I wrote my thesis on insider information many uh, moons ago, but uh, insider trading is illegal. And we have seen in the realm of scandals in the financial world many illegal activities. That's not what I'm writing about in this book. Illegal uh, is illegal, and, you know, that's that's for the law to decide. Yeah. What I focus more on is, especially in the later chapters, the gray areas, which I think have become a problem where things that where everybody did, you know, what wasn't illegal was supposed to be allowed. People did and got away, whatever they got away with. I call it the catch me if you can culture in banking right. and finance. And there was a study by a Swiss university saying that the finance profession kind of breeds a certain dishonesty. It's just inherent in the system and the incentives and the culture and this macho culture and this, you know, my profit is bigger than yours kind of uh, pressure. And so, um, yeah, I think the gray areas are the real problem because yeah. regulating things and the law is a bit of a problem, especially in our fast, um, vastly accelerated world, mm. because by the time you make the rules and they come into effect, the world has changed already, and then that's going to create other problems. For instance, banking regulation. After the crisis, we instituted stricter banking regulation, increasingly so, and now all the risky activity has gone into the shadow banking system, yeah. creating another risk that we haven't regulated. Mm. So, and this is another factor I'm addressing in the book is complexity thinking, that we need to rethink our whole system, redesign the system, and we need to employ a different kind of thinking to ask different questions, because apparently the way we've dealt with thing, things so far hasn't gotten us very far. It's gotten us more towards the brink. You mentioned um, a few moments ago about um, the fact that, you know, there is a r sort of ruthlessness element to uh, the business we're talking about, you know, George Soros, for example, is known as being quite ruthless. And, you know, there are phrases like, for example, you know, eat what you kill, um, you know, you're only as good as your last deal in the finance world. So it is, and you said it's, it can be full of testosterone. So how, um, you know, do all of these CEOs get to the top, seem very sociable and affable on the outside and, you know, um, willing to do good, but underneath, is there a very, very hardcore, ruthless, underbelly for these people, willing to do whatever it takes? Well, first of all, they're very um, open to risk, and risk yeah. um, th that is directly correlated to hormones, yes. testosterone namely. Um, and so 
that's one aspect. And then, mm. yes, I do think to some extent you have to tune off your emotions and, you know, they would probably rationalize it. And I call it the Teflonic, um, <laughs> you know, the, the um, willful blindness towards things and rationalizing facts. Because, yes, they have to be tough because otherwise they're going to be overta overtaken by the competition. Right, okay. So that toughness is a, is a requirement. Absolutely. And is that something you can build and get tougher or is it something you, you're born with, this element of risk taking and doing whatever it takes, Teflon coating if you like? I think both. I think yeah. people ri rise up in the system who are like that, who have yeah. a natural disposition, or you kind of get into this mill, into this yeah. treadmill, and then you adapt and become like it, or you make a conscious decision, like many women do at a certain level, who say, I don't, I don't really need this. I don't want to deal with this testosterone. I don't want to partake in this culture. It's annoying. I'm not really getting anywhere. Bye-bye. I'm starting my own company, or right. I'm going into a different field. Two questions, if I can, because I know that you're rushing off for a, another meeting and, and uh, your time is extremely valuable. So thank you for, for the time you're spending with us today. Actually, the penultimate question is about time. And you actually talk about it in the book, saying that the super hubs are acutely aware that they can always, and I quote, always make more money, but can never make more time. So how do highly successful people actually manage and see time? from an organizational perspective and where they decide to spend their time and invest their time? They prioritize quality over quantity and they're extremely disciplined with regard to time. Um, you have to be, if you travel across time zones, you know, they, they're very disciplined with their timing, their okay. diet, their exercise. Um, they're like in Davos, um, you know, part, some parties go on very long, but those who are really disciplined say bye-bye at a certain time right. and they're up early in the morning. So there, it's a little rigid, yeah. but you have to be disciplined. Yeah, so self-discipline is a real characteristic of, is that, is that quite similar to organization? Being highly organized or is it, I suppose you've got to have the discipline to be organized in you, so. I would say most people who I know are extremely well organized. Yeah, absolutely. Final question if I can, um, right at the beginning of your book, uh, you say you dedicate your book to your parents and to your grandparents. Um, why was that? Is that because they had a huge impact on you? It shaped you who you are today? Because they're the super helps of my life. <laughs> and I say, you know, we're all part of networks and we start out being attached to someone yeah. um, physically, literally, and thereafter our place in the world is determined uh, by our place in networks and I owe my grandparents and my parents everything um, they've always unconditionally supported and loved me and I think with regard to the profession it's, it, or generally in life it's very important to be grateful and acknowledge people who have stood by you and supported you throughout beautiful way to end and we're in fact very grateful for your time with us today Sandra Navidi thank you very much thank indeed. you for having me Anthony thank you. thanks